Hey class, uh, sorry that I'm, I'm a little late uh, on the jump today, um, but uh, it, it took a little longer than normal to prepare the notes. Uh, okay, so I wanted to start today's lecture with uh, just a, a thought from you know, abroad, uh, and then uh, we'll uh, finish our, our uh, discussion of um, what we have to say about the zeta function, uh, and then um, uh, that'll be it for the day. It'll, it'll take the rest of the time. <laughs> okay, so uh, so the the thought today uh, is just a, a discussion on on the tides, on on tidal forces, and, and what exactly that is. Um, and uh, you know, time permitting, uh, we we may be able to discuss uh, some implications of these thoughts. But um, it, for now, let's just discuss it, right? So okay, uh, so. Uh, the moon is tidally locked uh, to uh, the the earth and, and the oceans of the earth uh, so that we always get the same face of the moon so we say that you know or, or you know uh, previously it was said you know that there was a, a dark side of the moon uh, but it's really just dark to our perspective and that we never get to see the other side of it we always get the same face uh, because it uh, it follows us like like a camera essentially uh, and it's it's always focused on, on the Earth. Um, so uh, only the astronauts that, that have been up there have, have actually seen that far side of the moon. Um, but, uh, you know, what, what that means for the tides and the Earth, uh, it, it doesn't so much mean, mean anything necessarily that the, the moon isn't spinning about its own axis, that it's completely dependent on, on uh, the revolutions around the Earth. Um, it, for our discussion today, it's just interesting to note. Uh, okay, so uh, so you have two large bodies uh, orbiting each other. Uh, and they're going to exert uh, some gravitational force on one another. Uh, so the moon is going to pull the earth in that direction and the earth is going to pull the moon. Uh, okay, so that doesn't uh, tell the full story. Uh, whenever we compute these values, we always use center of mass because it simplifies the, the computations. Um, but it's interesting to note that you know each of these celestial bodies is exerting a, a field of gravitational potential, um, so that uh, the force, uh, or uh, if you will, the uh, the uh, the willingness to convert position to kinetic energy or, or a change of position to kinetic energy uh, is greater uh, whenever they're closer, like for the, the near side of these bodies to one another, with respect to one another, uh, than it is on, on the far side. Uh, so that uh, in the center you get this net effect, but uh, on the near side, the side of the Earth near the Moon, uh, you get a stronger effect. And on the side further away, you get a, a weaker effect. Uh, and the same is true on the surface of the Earth, or the Moon. Uh, okay, uh, and so uh, this, uh, this causes a, a swelling along the axis that, that joins these centers of mass, uh, so that you can, in effect, uh, you know, measure the swelling.
Uh, so in essence, you can uh, you can use the the field generated by the that body uh, and uh, the radius of the body that it's acting on, or you know the the uh, length in the in uh, the direction of the axis that connects it to the center of mass um, to uh, compute this this energy that's used to distend this body to to sort of pry it open to to pull it apart. Uh, and um, you know that energy is associated to a force, and so uh, it has this effect of creating this this force that that appears to be pushing uh, you know these uh, the, this diameter uh, in uh, apart, right? uh, and so um, that is what causes the swelling of the tide. So it's not so much that uh, so the moon is causing high tide. Uh, for the part nearest the moon uh, as well as the part furthest from the moon but it's not pushing that tide away it's just drawing every other part of the earth to it uh, faster uh, than it is the water on the surface you know at the furthest point and, and that's true you know of, uh, the area around the equator essentially uh, and so it, it's this flattening effect uh, and uh, the, the same uh, would be true of the moon uh, in that uh, you know, it's just uh, it's pulling so much harder on, on the side that's closer to it than it is on the one part a little further away, um, and so uh, yeah, it it's uh, it's an energy expended in in distending the radius, uh, and um, you know that leads to other interesting thoughts. Uh, anyway, uh, but um, we uh, <laughs> we ought to get started on this. Uh, okay. So uh, let's uh, let's take a look at, at Riemann's theorem. Um, okay, so uh, whenever he defined his uh, zeta function, uh, this uh, <laughs> this creature here, the, the functional equation, uh, he did it uh, using a variable s, uh, and uh, the real component was labeled sigma, and the imaginary component uh, was named uh, t. So, uh, so that s, the complex variable, is equal to sigma plus i t. Uh, and so uh, we defined the zeta function uh, on all of the complex plane, less the point 1 where it represents the uh, harmonic series and, and thus diverges. Uh, and it's given with this reflexive definition, uh, so that if we could just figure out what's going on in the critical strip, uh, then we would have a, a full picture of what's going on because sine is so well understood. Uh, and gamma and zeta uh, to the right of a uh, real part of s equals 1 is, is extremely well understood. Um, okay, so uh, let's start this discussion by uh, looking at the uh, a few of the symmetries uh, that are present. Uh, so zeta of s conjugate, uh, so if you did sigma minus i t, right, uh, is going to equal the conjugate of zeta of s. Uh, so it's conjugate symmetric about the real axis. Um, so if you conjugate the input, then it's the same as if you conjugated the output of the original value, uh, of the original input. Uh, okay, so then, um, uh, and then the functional equation tells us uh, that um, within the critical strip, uh, because you don't have uh, things canceling it out, uh, you don't have poles that are um, <laughs> neutralizing uh, the, those uh, zeros. Um, that uh, if you have zeta of s equals zero, then you have zeta of one minus s equals zero. Uh, but you have to be careful with this, or <laughs> you know, in the end, it, it turns out that you don't have to be too careful with it. Uh, but just be aware that one minus s is actually one minus sigma minus it, where this was sigma plus it. Um, but combined with this, we have that if zeta of s equals zero within the critical strip, then zeta of one minus s equals zero within the critical strip. Uh, and uh, then from conjugate symmetry, uh, we have that zeta, or the conjugate, <laughs> or uh, zeta of the conjugate of one minus s is equal to the conjugate, or zero conjugate, which is still just zero, right? Uh, and then zeta of s conjugate uh, would equal 
by conjugate symmetry would equal the conjugate of zero, which again is just zero, right? So uh, if you encounter one zero in the critical strip, then you encounter upwards of four, um, or if uh, Riemann's theorem is true, which we're sh we'll show, uh, really it's just two, uh, right? And so uh, you just get the ones at uh, zeta of s equals zero and zeta of s conjugate equals zero, and then these two collapse because uh, sigma has to be one half, and so it reduces to one of the other two zeros. Uh, okay, so in the case that sigma equals a half, then we have a pair of zeros, uh, which is what I just said, one half plus or minus it, uh, wherever you had that t. Uh, okay, so uh, from this version, we can see that there's this relationship, there's some constant that sits out here, and then there's this relationship between psi, sine, gamma, and zeta. Um, and uh, whenever uh, it was originally extended, uh, it was given as this product of two times sine of pi s times gamma of s times zeta of s is equal to i times the contour integral of this alternating term, negative z uh, to the s minus one, where it's outside the, the parentheses, uh, over e to the z minus one integrated with respect to z. Uh, and the contour um, was, uh, it's <laughs> similar to the keyhole contour or whatever, but uh, it circles the axis and then goes along the, the real plane uh, off to infinity, but then uh, in order to compute these values of t, they, um, <laughs> they, they contrasted it with this other contour, which was just a big box that encircled uh, multiples of 2 pi i. Uh, and, um, you know, all of that is, is well beyond <laughs> like what, what we even want to look at, and even a, a superficial review of this. Um, but uh, that's kind of where we get this from. Right. So we start with uh, gamma of s, we make some manipulations, we get zeta of s, we get some integral that uh, looks a little bit like this. Uh, and then we consider this product with sine, uh, and we end up with this contour integral, which uh, is defined for the entire plane, uh, which is wonderful. Um, but neither gamma of s nor sine of s has any zeros within the critical strip. So uh, this integral is going to inherit zeros in that strip from zeta of s. Uh, and this is really as close as we're going to get to uh, <laughs> to anything that we can really hammer uh, to, to prove this thing. Uh, so let's use it. Um, okay, uh, so you know, I, I discussed uh, a little bit about the choices and, and uh, you know, Alfors who was working off of, uh, Lars Alfors who was working off of uh, Riemann's work um, used uh, a definition of uh, <laughs> a bounding of uh, an imaginary part of the log of negative z uh, to be between negative pi and pi uh, so that this contour um, was defined uh, in in that branch uh, so um, that's the branch that we're looking for whenever we're defining this contour uh, and then we're going to take advantage of uh, of residue theory, uh, and uh, not strictly to compute it, but uh, you know the the framework around it, uh, which tells us essentially that uh, the contour, if you're integrating around a singular point, um, doesn't really uh, matter, right? Uh, so long as it's a, a closed contour, then it is really fully determined by the winding number and, and so forth. Um, but uh, we end up, in part, because this integral is uh, dealing with, uh, you know, values uh, within this contour, um, or, or within our integrand, uh, if, if we factor out this negative 1 to the s minus 1, uh, then we end up with this. Um, but this, uh, for sigma between um, 0 and uh, 1, we see that this is actually a negative value. So this actually ranges from zero to negative one, um, or uh, negative one to zero, <laughs> if you prefer. Uh, and so that this, this truly, uh, the, the modulus of this actually belongs to the denominator, uh, so that whenever we consider uh, the point z uh, at the origin, where, where z is zero, uh, then we have uh, one, per, one term here, a factor here, uh, which uh, is a pole e to the z e to the zero would be one so one minus one is an 
or in the denominator is going to create a pole. Uh, and then we get uh, something that's, that's not a pole of full order that's also augmenting that value. Uh, and so it, <laughs> you know, that, uh, that could explain, you know, some of the weirdness with, uh, around this function. Um, but um, uh, luckily we're not actually going to touch the pole, which would really affect uh, our, our integral here. Uh, we're going to, to take advantage of uh, the part of the contour that was originally defined uh, and uh, just use the unit circle. Uh, so rather than uh, trying to have the, uh, the contour vanish by letting it you know, uh, drop off to uh, something of radius zero uh, at its limit, or, or trying to swell it to something of radius infinity, uh, or trying to run it along the real axis or, or anything like that, uh, we're gonna use the unit circle and we'll see that that allows for uh, some simplifications. Uh, and so uh, keeping with uh, Riemann and L4's uh, boundaries for, for our choices of Z, um, we're going to use the unit circle and uh, we'll define it uh, so that its, its argument is bounded between negative pi and pi at its limits. Um, so then uh, the contour, uh, you know, by, uh, by definition of a path integral, uh, we're going to substitute z with e to the i omega. Uh, and so uh, here we get a straight substitution. Uh, and then this is uh, dz. So the derivative of this is i e to the i omega. Uh, z here is actually in the exponent. So we get this weird e to the e to the i omega term, uh, which uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll be dancing around for a while. Uh, but you know, it, it all comes out in the wash. Um, OK, uh, so then um, now we see that this i cancels here. Uh, and, and so we get this uh, you know, negative term. Uh, and then, uh, so we get this negative one. And then this, uh, we, we pull it back out. Uh, and um, we do, in fact, have a different integral than, than we'd originally begun with, because we're actually doing a, a contour. Uh, and we're going from negative pi to pi rather than from zero infinity, zero to infinity or uh, anything like that. Uh, but what are we to make of this? Um, okay, well, really we're interested in what's actually happening inside the integral. Uh, but, and we have this log of negative one. Um, and so <laughs> probably the, the fairest way to treat this is, uh, well, we know that it, it won't be zero because it's e to the i something, right? And Nothing in this exponent where s, the real part of s is between 0 and 1, uh, is really going to change that. Uh, so let's consider the geometric mean of, uh, of the two choices for log of negative 1. Uh, so one being negative pi uh, and the other being pi. Uh, and so if we take the, the geometric mean of this with the two possible definitions, uh, then we end up with this. Right? Uh, and so here, it's e to the i pi, and here it's e to the i negative pi. Um, and then uh, this, uh, hmm. I don't know that we actually needed these i's here. <laughs> so maybe these i's are actually superfluous. Uh, I, I think it canceled out here whenever we brought this i forward. Uh, but I, I didn't remove it from my notes. Anyway, but we have a, a negative e to the i pi to the s minus 1 here, and negative e to the i minus i pi to the s minus 1. Uh, well, you know, this is uh, conjugate multiplication. So we're multiplying a, a term by a factor by its conjugate. Um, and so we're going to get 1. So this, this washes out. The negatives cancel each other out. Uh, and so then the geometric mean is just the square root of this squared. So we're, we get back to this, which is... Uh, what we really wanted to work with all along. So by considering the geometric mean, we actually uh, you know, end up back here. Oh, and I want to point out that this uh, s to the minus 1 actually goes away whenever we consider our uh, contour integral. Because um, whenever we take the derivative, we get this. Uh, so the i gets pulled out front, we get that. But this is the same as this. And so we raise the exponent by 1, uh, and we end up with this to the s. Uh, okay, so this is what we're working with now. Uh, okay, uh, so now we need to <laughs> come up with some approach to uh, what uh, 
<laughs> I think, uh, is uh, an unruly problem, uh, to be to say the least. Uh, okay, so you know, let's assume for contradiction's sake that uh, there uh, there exists some choice of sigma where t is greater than zero, uh, and sigma is not on the critical line. It's not equal to one half. Then, um, then using the, the symmetries that we identified before, uh, there's some complement to S uh, such that one minus sigma uh, is plus I T is also going to be zero, right? So we have uh, that they're uh, that they're both zero individually, which makes them equal to each other, uh, which makes their difference equal to zero, right? Uh, and so we're we're going to take a, a long-winded way, uh, kind of, uh, to show that really anything above something like 1.4 something uh, is uh, this this condition is not possible to meet. Um, so uh, that'll <laughs> that'll be at the end. Uh, okay. So all non-trivial zeros uh, lie in this domain for sigma uh, in the uh, in zero to one. Uh, okay, so uh, just restating this, instead of s, we have sigma plus it, uh, and so this assertion here, where we assume that you know there's something that equals zero, uh, let's find it. Let's see if such a thing is possible. Uh, so we have the the s and then s complement. So sigma plus it one minus sigma plus it. Denominator is the same. Uh, it's still, you know, absolutely convergent. It's um, so the the series uh, we have no problem combining them into a single integral, common denominator. Uh, it it works out just fine. Uh, and it's interesting. Uh, uh, well, <laughs> now we need to clean it up a little bit because we have e to the i omega in both of these, uh, and then that itself is raised to some complex value. Uh, but it follows the rules of, of exponential arithmetic. So we bring it down, we multiply it out, uh, and in both cases we end up with this leading e to the minus omega t. Uh, and then in the first one we end up with e to the i omega sigma, and in the second one we end up with e to the i omega 1 minus sigma. Um, okay, uh, and so now we have this leading e to the negative omega t, uh, and then this, which, you know, uh, what is that? Uh, and then this is the denominator and, you know, d omega or whatever. So we know we're integrating around a contour. Um, okay, well, we're we're doing our best to acquaint ourselves with numerical methods. So let's take a second and, and uh, just consider what this, this means if we're sampling it over the this contour. Um, so this, we'll see, uh, ends up with uh, a weird... Uh, so the first thing you have to do is convert this to something that's a little more familiar. So e to the i omega is uh, the cosine of omega plus i times the sine of omega. Uh, and so by exponential arithmetic, this then becomes e to the cosine of omega times e to the i sine of omega. Uh, and then, you know, that, then again we end up with this. Uh, so that's our, our modulus uh, for, for just this part right here, and then the minus 1 also factors in. Uh, and so then we end up with um, a real part uh, of something like uh, e to the cosine omega times uh, cosine of sine of omega uh, <laughs> and an imaginary part or, or you know, a complex component of i times e to the cosine of omega times uh, the sine of sine of omega. <laughs> so we have these embedded trig functions, but not impossible to deal with. It's the domain is bounded. It's fixed. Uh, it seems like the modulus isn't going to go crazy, uh, and the argument is only slightly skewed off of what we would get from the unit circle uh, because of this minus one. Uh, so you know that's that's not a terrible thing to deal with. I think we're going to be able to manage that. This looks like exponential decay. Uh, so it starts at negative pi at omega of negative pi and goes up to pi. T is determined, you know, as soon as we choose our value s, then T is fixed with respect to the integral. So this is essentially a constant with respect to the variable of integration. So we have exponential decay. 
uh, we have something that you know kind of moves around in a circle. Uh, and then these are cosine plus I sine terms, uh, which is just points on a unit circle. So we have a point on a unit circle here on, on the complex unit circle, minus a point on the complex unit circle here. Well, this just defines a chord. Uh, and so it's, uh, it's gonna be the same every time as you move up the critical strip with respect to some choice sigma. Uh, and so it's you know it's it's varying as you uh, move around uh, as omega changes right as you go from negative pi to pi, uh, but it's just these two points on a on a unit circle that are kind of uh, chasing each other or you know moving around, um, and so this is is never less than zero or well I guess it's never less than negative two. Uh, and it's never more than two. So the absolute value of this is bounded by two. Well, you know, that's not impossible to deal with. Uh, so let's see what we can make of this. Um, okay, so we're gonna split this problem up into the critical line and then everything else in the critical strip. Uh, but we're gonna break it up in half. We're only gonna consider between one half and one uh, because it's it has that reflexive that, that symmetry about the critical line where if you find a zero off the critical line to the right of it then you've automatically found that one that complements it right, at one minus sigma. So it's enough to just consider sigma between one half and one. Um, and then uh, whenever sigma is equal to a half uh, then uh, this becomes e to the i omega times one half and this becomes e to the i omega one minus one half, well that's one half. So then this is just identically zero. So it, it vanishes always uh, at zero, which is what we would expect uh, because we're considering the difference between uh, you know something uh, between one half and one and its complement over here. Well, these, these are identical integrals if sigma equals a half. Uh, so we would expect the, di the difference to always be zero. Uh, so really the only interesting case is every other case, right? And so this just says what I, this <laughs> it says the exact same thing, uh, that that one minus sigma becomes uh, one half and then it vanishes. Uh, so it's identically zero on the critical line. Uh, so we wanna know, is it ever zero off the critical line within the critical strip between one half and one? Uh, okay, uh, so the way we're gonna do that is, um, or the way we're going to demonstrate it is uh, by considering the moduluses. And we'll, we'll show essentially that the modulus can never be zero when that's the case. Uh, and it's because, uh, the, it, it's because of this exponential decay, uh, essentially. So we can divide this up into a head, which is the first quarter arc about the unit circle in our contour, uh, and a tail, which is the other three quarters of the three-quarters arc of the unit circle. Um, and uh, this will define some value that's greater than zero, strictly speaking, that's, uh, you know, whose absolute value is, is always greater than zero. It won't change sign during that contour. Uh, and then this is, is nothing. It vanishes way too quickly to ever cancel out whatever happens here. Uh, so that the only way we can get a zero is if we're on the critical line. Uh, so let's go forth and, and spend another eight pages doing that. Uh, okay, so this is the story of the denominator. So we have that e to the e to the i omega minus one. Uh, and so we just considered the modulus, right? Because we're, we're trying to find some upper bound for this tail. And we don't have to be too strict with it, uh, but we do need something that depends on uh, sigma so we can <laughs> do this... Uh, this uh, memorable <laughs> limit <laughs> at the end. Uh, okay, um, so yeah, just the modulus here, whenever we're creating the upper bound, the modulus, uh, it, it can be really loose. Um, and so uh, we see that we have this here, right? Uh, and it's the square root, yada, yada, yada. Um, and so uh, independent of the choice of sigma, uh, we see that uh, it, because there is no sigma term here. So this is just fully determined uh, by our, our unit circle. Uh, and it's always gonna, it's gonna be periodic because of this right here. Uh, and so this modulus always uh, is fixed between 
two as a, a strict upper bound and one half uh, as a strict lower bound. Um, and so it's minimal uh, at the odd multiples of pi uh, and it's maximal at the even multiples of pi. Uh, and that's because this term right here is uh, maximal at the even multiples of pi. Uh, okay, um, so now uh, to do the upper bound for the tail, uh, we've handled the denominator. Now we need to figure out what's going on with that chord and, and what statements we can make about it. Uh, and so we do a, a little bit of arithmetic, uh, you know, complex arithmetic. Uh, so this can always be written right, where this is the argument, right? Of uh, so this is cosine of this plus i times sine of this. Uh, so this is the argument for both cosine and sine. Uh, and then this is just the, the same problem rewritten. Um, and so the absolute value uh, is the square root of uh, z times z conjugate, uh, essentially. So this is z, <laughs> this first part, and this is z conjugate. So to get this absolute value, uh, we'll uh, multiply these two together uh, it's, uh, and, and we end up with something that looks like cosine squared plus sine squared. Uh, but you know, uh, doing it explicitly then uh, this cancels out and this cancels out. Right? So we get one here. Uh, this is the conjugate multiplied or you know, this is a value multiplied by its conjugate so we again get one. Uh, and then uh, whenever we do uh, the outer terms, then we get this, right? so minus this, and then the inner terms, we get this, so minus that. Um, and, uh, yeah. Uh, okay, uh, and so uh, those, we end up with um, something that is its, uh, own conjugate, right? So here it's two sigma minus one, here it's one minus two sigma. Um, but if we rewrite it in this form, then we can see that this is in fact the conjugate of this. Um, and so, uh, you know, pull out the negative and stick it in parentheses. Um, and any number plus its conjugate is going to be two times the real component. So that simplifies to two times cosine of omega times two sigma minus one. Um, and so the modulus here uh, is exactly equal to this. Um, okay, uh, so we have the bounds on the denominator. Uh, and since we're looking for an upper bound, we want the most lenient denominator. That is, we want to make the denominator as small as possible. Uh, so we just choose the easiest point, so we choose the strict uh, uh, lower bound for the denominator, which is going to help us identify a strict upper bound for the ratio. Right. So that uh, the modulus of this, this factor, uh, is bounded above by the square root of 2 minus 2 cosine of omega times 2 sigma minus 1. Uh, divided by a half. Well, the half comes up here. This comes out as a square root of 2. So we end up with 2 square root of 2 times 1, the square root of 1 minus cosine of yada, yada, yada. Uh, okay. Uh, so now, um, uh, okay, uh, so we want to simplify this even further. <laughs> so uh, we're again going to be as generous as possible whenever we're, we're estimating this. Um, so uh, we're going to create an upper bound for the modulus of this integral, for the modulus of the tail, um, using those simplifications uh, for this. Right? So we're, we're maximizing this factor within the integrand uh, with this, or you know, we're, we're bounding it above, I shouldn't say maximizing. Uh, and then uh, we just carry out the integral because there's no longer uh, d omega, or there's no longer uh, an omega within this term. Uh, <laughs> I, I left out d omega here, but it's, it's there. Uh, that was just a, a typo. Uh, and so uh, we can actually evaluate this, right? And so this is just, again, the integral of 
uh, e to the negative omega t with respect to omega. Um, and so uh, we end up with uh, negative 1 over t times e to the omega t evaluated at these points. Um, and so, uh, so this is our, the result of our integral once we've made those simplifications. Uh, and then uh, this itself is bounded, uh, is an upper bound for all of this. Uh, where, um, so you have pi, you evaluate it with omega equal to pi, and you get some negative value, uh, and then minus uh, omega equal to negative pi over 2, um, so that you end up with e to the pi over 2 here, uh, but negative, uh, a negative uh, is going to be uh, positive. Um, so, uh, so this leading negative actually tells us that we can uh, just take this value uh, and we drop off the subtraction so that we have a, an upper bound here. So um, yeah, uh, so we're not dealing with you know, some uh, subtracting anything off of this. Uh, and the other value uh, would have been positive and, and strictly smaller uh, than this. Our, uh, I should say strictly smaller than this portion right here, which is where we would evaluate it. Uh, so that this is indeed a a, uh, a good upper bound on what we're looking for. Uh, okay. Uh, so now uh, we have to move to the head uh, so that we can show that these uh, that that first quarter arc uh, has a modulus that is. Uh, with real part that's always strictly positive uh, and uh, whose value is uh, greater than some upper bound for the modulus of the tail uh, so that uh, it and then that this disparity uh, is in fact sufficient to show that the integral is never zero um, whenever sigma is not equal to one half um, uh, okay uh, so again, we, we're looking at this ratio uh, of the, the chord uh, and uh, this <laughs> slightly weird denominator. Uh, so uh, we expand this, the exponent there, and we end up with that e to the cosine of omega times e to the i sine of omega, as promised. Um, and so this uh, can be written in polar coordinates with modulus uh, and argument. Um, and the argument is negative because it's in the denominator, and it's just the argument of, of this. Right? Uh, and then we haven't really done anything to the numerator yet. Um, okay, uh, and now uh, if we carry out the multiplication, then this gets pulled into the exponents here. Uh, so uh, now we have this, uh, this minus i times that argument and this minus i times that argument. Uh, and now um, we can readily evaluate the, the real parts and the, the complex part um, so that we have cosine minus cosine for the real part from these uh, where this again becomes the argument to cosine right? same here uh, minus uh, sine uh, Of, of that argument uh, minus sign. Yes, uh, and the uh, yeah, that should probably be a plus, I think. Uh, right, uh, but uh, <laughs> we will see. That doesn't matter. <laughs> um, the, the imaginary part is going to get dropped off. So we're looking at the head, uh, and really everything will be fully determined uh, by using the real part as an effective lower bound for the modulus. Uh, and so the imaginary part, whether this is positive or negative, uh, would only seek to add to the, the length of that modulus. But we drop it off anyway. So uh, never mind that plus sign hiding behind the curtain, right? Uh, OK, uh, so. Um, uh, uh, okay, uh, 
Uh, so now we're going to try and figure out, okay, well, what is this argument of this thing right here? Um, well, we can break this down into a real and imaginary component, and the real part is x, and the imaginary part is y. Uh, or, you know, um, it, we have something of this form, right, where in polar coordinates we have rho times e to the i theta. Uh, and the argument, whenever, you know, it's, it's in here, uh, is given by the arc tangent of the ratio between the rise over the run, uh, right? Uh, and so, you know, rho cancels out, and the only thing that really matters is the argument of, you know, it is the sine over cosine-ness of it. Um, okay, uh, so, um, you know, this is still the case. We can consider it even if we have some negative theta, the negative, you know, passes right through and we end up with negative uh, arctangent. Uh, okay, so we have this, and the argument can be computed using arctangent. Um, okay. Uh, so now we're going to move on uh, to uh, how are we going to prove this beast because we're looking at an absolute value uh, and the absolute value is outside the integral and we need to get it inside the integral and in particular we need to do it in a way that we can <laughs> prove something you know for all choices of, of t and sigma in our range uh, and so forth. Uh, okay so the absolute value of z is uh, the absolute value, uh, and this is just you know, the same thing restated, but the real part of z plus i times the imaginary part of z. Uh, and that's, this absolute value is equivalent to the square root of the real part squared plus the imaginary part squared, right? Cosine squared plus sine squared, right? um, uh, times the radius, right? Uh, and so this is strictly greater, right? Because this is non-negative and this is non-negative. Uh, this is strictly greater, or uh, sorry, not strictly greater. This is greater than or equal to the real part, the square root of the real part, uh, where we've just dropped off the imaginary part. Right? So this is a lower bound for it. So uh, the uh, the real part of z, and I should say the absolute value of the real part of z, is a lower bound, uh, you know, uh, less than or equal to the absolute value of z, the absolute value of the original part. Uh, okay, so in the case of a summation, uh, if we have it on the outside of the summation, right, over some series z sub j, uh, then we have the sum of those terms, right, and they're all real parts plus imaginary parts. Um, and so we can break it up into two sums, uh, and, you know, keeping these on the outside. Uh, and in particular, we now have uh, an imaginary part times a sum of imaginary parts plus the sum over real parts. Well, this is just some new value z, right? So a real part plus an imaginary part. So this is the real part, and this is exactly equal to the square root of this squared plus this squared, right? Uh, and again, by the same logic, this is still just some, some value that's non-negative. Um, so we can drop it off and have some lower bound, uh, which depends just on the real part. Right? Uh, so the square root goes away, and we now have that this sum, the absolute value of that sum, uh, is greater than or equal to uh, the absolute value of the sum of just those real parts. Right? Uh, okay, uh, so now let's consider this further, right? So we, we, we really want to push these even further so that we're dealing with something where the absolute value is inside the sum. Uh, okay, so consider the case where every term within this sum, uh, the, the real part of z sub j doesn't change sign, right? So that whatever it is at the beginning of the sum, it is throughout the, the domain of that sum, uh, so that they all share the same sign. Then this is bounded below by this, which is what we showed here. Uh, but now we have that each one of these terms is the sine of that jth term times the absolute value, right? So whenever you factor out sine, well, this is either one or negative one. Uh, and what was previously you know, something times one or negative one, uh, we can now stick inside an absolute value sign. So it's one or negative one times whatever it was before. Uh, but we're assuming, you know, in this strict case uh, where this is the case, uh, where they all share the same sign, then we can replace this by the sign 
of the real part of that first term. And since all of these share that value, either one or negative one, uh, then we can pull it out as a factor to the series. Right? So we have that sign times the sum all wrapped within these absolute value signs. Uh, okay, well now this is uh, an absolute summation uh, and this is the absolute value of this sign which is plus one or negative one. Well that just goes away. Right? And so in this strict case where the sign doesn't change over the sum, then this is uh, is greater than or equal to the sum uh, of the absolute values of just those real parts. Uh, so that now we can use uh, a lower bound considering just the real part. We pulled in that absolute value uh, and, and we're going to take advantage of that. <laughs> uh, okay, and so uh, just for review, we state uh, we're using the, the limit of the, the trapezoid rule uh, as our definition of the integral. So it's the first evaluation plus that last evaluation times delta over two, uh, and then all of the other samples uh, from n equals one to k minus one is f of a plus n times delta times delta to compute our area. Uh, so that's the choice of the integral that we're using. Uh, okay, uh, so uh, if we let alpha omega be in r and then z of omega be in a uh, complex number, uh, and the sign of z of omega uh, is constant, uh, then we have, uh, and that should really be the sign of the real part of z of omega. And again, it's just another typo, but sign of the real part of this. Sorry about that. Uh, okay, then we go from this, right, this integral from a to b of e to the alpha omega times z omega, z of omega, uh, d omega. Uh, then in terms of summations, right, so that we can use our previous results. Uh, so we're using the, the trapezoid limit here. Right? Uh, so then uh, this breaks down into a real part and an imaginary part, uh, right? And so these evaluations are just real parts and imaginary parts, and it's all addition because it's, you know, real part plus i times the imaginary part. Uh, okay, so we've broken it up nicely there. Uh, and now uh, we've dropped off the imaginary part relying on that, that first observation we made that um, the absolute value of uh, the real part is always going to be less than or equal to the absolute value of the whole. Okay. Uh, so we've created a, a little bit of a lower bound here uh, and now uh, we're pulling out uh, this, <laughs> this sign, whatever it was, if it's constant over this uh, uh, domain, uh, then we can pull it out uh, and the uh, absolute value sign can go inside uh, and we can now restate our integral with the lower bound of this, right? So the integral from a to b, e to the alpha omega times the absolute value of the real part of z of omega d omega. Uh, okay, so it's promising. It looks like we might be able to come up with some lower bound for this monstrosity. Uh, okay, uh, so it doesn't change sign. Uh, the modulus of the original integral can be bounded below in those cases. Uh, okay, so now we want to construct a lower bound uh, for the integral, and we begin with that factor, the, the fraction, uh, which is in effect our z of omega. Right? So it depends on omega. Uh, the choice of sigma, yeah, kind of sigma and t <laughs> both contribute to uh, define this family of integrals, but um, anyway. Uh, so uh, with absolute value of its real component given by this, right, where we've just stuck an absolute value around it, we've expanded uh, these to uh, cosine and so forth. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, and so this is our, our new lower bound because this is the real part. Uh, we're considering the absolute value of the denominator. Right? We did that and moved the argument into the numerator so that it was all calculated at once. Uh, okay, um, so this is our lower bound uh, for our the the term which will help us establish that lower bound. Uh, okay, so now uh, we have uh, sigma in the open interval one half to one. We have omega. Uh, ranging from negative pi to pi over 2 for uh, our head in this integral. 
Um, and uh, this is the real part of this, um, or which we're going to use for our lower bound, is uh, given by this. Right? Um, and uh, for uh, any choice sigma, so whatever choice sigma you choose, uh, this this value, this ratio, decreases monotonically um, with respect to omega. So it's um, so it's minimal at negative pi, and it's maximal at negative pi over two. Um, so in order, uh, or sorry, uh, it's minimal at negative pi over two, and it's maximal at negative pi. Uh, so in order to be as pessimistic as possible with this lower bound, uh, we choose it whenever it's minimal, uh, which is negative pi over two. Uh, so we can we can substitute that. Uh, and you know we're, we're not changing sign so we know that uh, if we replace it with just the smallest uh, value the smallest evaluation over its domain of integration uh, and it's decreasing monotonically uh, then that can function as a lower bound uh, so we make that substitution so that this no longer depends on omega uh, in either the numerator or the denominator uh, and so let's <laughs> it's, it's effectively a constant now uh, so let's call it kappa of sigma, uh, and it's defined by this in the numerator, uh, and the denominator is still given by this. Uh, okay, so now the head of our integral uh, is uh, you know, this absolute value, uh, which will you know, uh, we'll bound it below, and then we'll show that that lower bound uh, for some value t is always uh, strictly greater than whatever the tail can muster up in its best day. Uh, okay, uh, so this uh, is greater than or equal to um, if we move the absolute value signs inside uh, and just consider the real part. Uh, and at this point we can drop the absolute values on the outer part. Uh, and so this, expanding it into those cosines, right, into that core definition, or, or just the real part, uh, with the denominator common to both terms uh, looks like this um, and then making our substitution we can again say that it's greater than or equal to uh, where it's minimal over this domain uh, so that now we have something that does not vary with respect to omega uh, and so we can integrate with respect to just e to the negative omega t okay? so uh, and then we've created a strict lower bound uh, by replacing the denominator uh, with um, the value where it is maximal, which is just 2. Right? So then we pull out that 1 half, so that this is 2, and because it's in the denominator, it's 1 over 2, so we just pull it out. Uh, and so we have this, which we're going to integrate, and this, which is constant with respect to omega, <laughs> now that we've made uh, several simplifications. Uh, okay, so now we have uh, this, which is kappa sigma, um, divided by 2, times this integral of e to the negative omega t d omega, uh, and this is equal to this, right, because there's this negative sign, so when you integrate it, the negative comes out front. Uh, that uh, evaluated from negative pi to uh, negative pi over 2. Uh, we don't get to magically get rid of it <laughs> the way we did the other one uh, because uh, again we have to be as pessimistic as possible when creating this lower bound uh, so we have one half uh, times this uh, which is equal once we integrate to this um, and so now uh, we want to uh, prove our inequality. And we want to show that the modulus uh, for the head is always strictly greater than the modulus for the tail. Uh, so that this can never cancel out what we integrate in that first part. And we can show that this modulus is never zero as well. So that this is uh, strictly greater than zero. Um, and, and in fact, it's strictly greater than whatever we chose uh, as, as some positive value for an upper bound on the modulus of this tail. Um, okay, uh, so uh, that inequality, uh, 
we start making substitutions. So for the head, uh, we start moving towards our lower bound. So it's that integral, uh, the lower bound of that integral, and then we evaluate it, and it's this times kappa sigma. Uh, and that is greater than, or we will eventually show that that's greater than the upper bound for the tail, uh, where this is the upper bound for this tail. So that this is greater than this, uh, as we want to show. Okay? Uh, for all value t, greater than some beginning point capital T. Uh, okay, uh, so our head is greater than our tail. Right? That's what we're trying to show. Uh, so. Uh, we move the 2t over to the right hand side uh, and this becomes uh, 4 square root of 2. This t is cancelled out by this. Uh, this stays the same. Uh, and then we have this e to the pi t minus e to the pi over 2t. Uh, so we move this over to the left hand side. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, we move the kappa sigma over to the right hand side. And then we move this to the left hand side. And this no, uh, neutralizes this, so that's, that's minus 1, uh, and then over here it's t times pi minus pi over 2, so this eventually becomes e to the t pi over 2. We move this 1 to the right hand side, so now this is our right hand side which depends fully on sigma, and this is our left hand side which depends fully on t. Uh, and we say that t, uh, our, the result is established whenever t is greater than whatever is over here, uh, and this is our declaration for our choice of t. Okay? Uh, and so uh, once we've taken the log of both sides, we see that this is uh, t would have to be greater than 2 divided by pi times the natural log of 4 square root of 2 times the square root of 1 minus cosine of pi times 2 sigma minus 1 divided by kappa sigma, which is our, our chord, that cosine of the argument minus the cosine of its complementary sigma point in the critical strip plus one okay, uh, okay. <laughs> so uh, well we just have to resolve this thing that's going on about sigma uh, in order to get there uh, okay but it's you know we at least have uh, something that we can uh, evaluate right uh, so T will be uh, established as this uh, or you know something in that neighborhood um, and so uh, sigma is entirely, it, it really only participates right here in this ratio. So we have the square root of 1 minus the cosine of pi times 2 sigma minus 1 divided by the cosine of this times this, right? Uh, and so we see that the numerator goes to 0 as sigma goes to a half, right? So this becomes 2 times 1 half would be 1. And so that would go to 1 minus 1. So that would be cosine of pi times 0, which would be cosine of 0, which is 1. So the numerator goes to the square root of 1 minus 1, which is 0. The denominator goes to uh, cosine of negative pi over 2 times sigma minus the argument of the denominator right, from before, right, that weird e to the e to the i omega minus 1. So this is the argument from that that we pulled in. Uh, and then uh, minus the cosine of uh, that complementary point within the critical strip. Uh, so negative pi over 2 times 1 minus sigma minus that argument of the denominator. Uh, okay, well this is the same as this over here. Uh, and as sigma goes to 1 half, this goes to, uh, this would be negative pi over 2 times 1 half minus this, which is the same over here. Well, sigma would be 1 half over here, so it would be negative pi over 2 times 1 half. So then the denominator would also go to 0. So we end up with this point which we need to establish whether or not it's uh, zero uh, or a removable singularity or a pole. Uh, okay, uh, so let's let's do some power series expansions. Uh, so the numerator, this, right, uh, if we expand it out we get 1 minus uh, 1 minus, uh, you know, x squared over 2 factorial plus x to the 4 over 4 factorial minus x to the 6 over 6 factorial and so forth. Right. So this is a series expansion for cosine, uh, and uh, it, the ones cancel out. Uh, this negates this and flips this sign as well, and so forth. So it flips the signs of the series. So we end up with this, uh, you know, which we factor out, uh, and so this whole thing was squared. So that gets unsquared. 
uh, this becomes a square root in order to factor it out. And so we end up with this new series where uh, we divide the numerators by uh, this squared, right? So what was the four to the fourth power before becomes squared. This gives a leading one, uh, and we can see that this will be non-zero uh, whenever sigma goes to one half, right? So every term after this, when sigma is one half, is going to disappear, and we end up with just square root of one inside. Right? So we have this, which is the leading term. Uh, okay, uh, and then uh, here. Uh, we have uh, this first part of the denominator, right? So for sigma, we end up with this. Well, <laughs> let's do the expansion, right? So one minus x squared over two factorial plus x to the four over four factorial, uh, where this argument is x, right? Uh, and then this is that second one, right? Uh, so that this is uh, you know, the series expansion here. It's given by one minus x squared over 2 factorial plus x to the 4 over 4 factorial, etc. Right? Uh, so we make those uh, expansion substitutions and we pull this out uh, and you know we see that we have uh, this, this first order 0 in the numerator when sigma goes to 1 half uh, and then something that tends to 1 uh, and then uh, we have this uh, second uh, let's see, uh, and then we have uh, that first cosine expansion minus that second cosine expansion. Uh, so the ones are going to cancel out, uh, which is nice. Um, and so we need to evaluate what's happening with the rest of the denominator. Uh, and so we have this negative x squared over 2 factorial right? uh, minus a minus, so plus. Uh, you know, uh, x squared over 2 factorial and so forth. Um, so we've, uh, here we've flipped the signs, right? So this is minus and plus, and then within the second one, because of this minus sign, we flip the sign, so that is plus and then minus, right? Uh, and so they continue to alternate in that fashion. Uh, so now, <laughs> let's just consider what's going on with this leading term so we can get some sense of, of where that's going uh, and, and what's going to happen with the denominator. Uh, okay, so this, uh, if we square it, then we end up with, uh, you know, uh, a squared plus b squared plus uh, ab plus ba, right? Uh, and the same thing here, right? So it's, uh, <laughs> we, we use those, uh, you know, we multiply it out. Uh, and so because this is positive, I moved it to the leading term. So this term is now this first one, and this one is now the second one. Uh, because of this minus sign, I wanted it to come second, right? So this squared plus this squared, uh, and then it ends up uh, that this times this, right? So uh, it's uh, two times, so a squared plus b squared plus two times ab, right? Uh, the negatives cancel out whenever they multiply each other. Uh, and we end up with um, this plus two times uh, their product. Right? Uh, and then the story is very similar uh, in uh, the other, uh, the first, the leading term of the other expansion uh, is that we have uh, this squared plus this squared uh, plus two times AB. Uh, okay, and then we have this other thing that we actually need to square right here, right? Uh, and so we pull out the pi squared over, or the pi over two squared, right? So we have that in both leading. The sigma squared evaluates pretty easily. Uh, and then this um, becomes uh, one minus two sigma times, or uh, plus sigma squared. Uh, and so this is the same uh, as this, so the coefficient's the same. Uh, the sign is opposite, so these squared terms actually cancel out, and we end up with 1 minus 2 sigma over here, and 1 minus 2 sigma over here, and we can pull that out, 1 minus 2 sigma, uh, and that's actually the negative of this. Um, this arc tangent uh, is evaluated for some negative sign, uh, and so 
uh, that'll actually end up uh, becoming uh, some negative value uh, so that um, so that this term cancels out the negative here the fact that this is negative 2 sigma minus 1 uh, which was in the denominator over here uh, so we end up with a, a positive value um, that uh, whose limit is uh, is well defined. It, it doesn't uh, shoot off to infinity. In fact, that 1 minus 2 sigma, that first order pole, uh, turns out to be a removable singularity. Uh, and so uh, this, this evaluates. So in fact, that ratio uh, that's causing so much trouble uh, is strictly bounded above by 3 over 2. Uh, and we've shown analytically uh, that there is no pole at sigma equals a half for that ratio. Uh, and numerically, you can compute uh, that it, it resolves to something that's bounded above by 3, uh, three over 2. Uh, in fact, it's um, uh, I don't know, the ratio, oh, uh, 1.473288 something. So I just used 3 halves as an upper bound. Um, okay. Uh, so that simplifies things dramatically. So now we can compute t, you know, directly. So uh, we'll just move it forward a little bit and use this upper bound. Uh, and so now we have that t is less than uh, two uh, divided by pi, which was there before, times the natural log of four times square root of two times three halves plus one. So this is uh, this four is knocked down a little by that, times 3, this becomes 6 times square root of 2 plus 1. So uh, 2 times the natural log of 6 square root of 2 plus 1 divided by pi uh, is bounded above by 1.5. Uh, so uh, Riemann's theorem is true uh, whenever t is greater than, than this upper bound for that t, uh, so 1.5. Um, so the, the first zero occurs, I, I want to say, it's at like 14 something <laughs> I, I don't remember I think it's like 14 and then 21 or something uh, I, I it's been a while since I've looked at that uh, anyway um, so yeah uh, we were, were able to show that uh, it's uh, that integral that that difference of sums is non-zero uh, whenever you get away from the critical strip and it's uh, it's um, a result of, of the fact that uh, you have this exponential, like that it's represented by this exponential decay, and if you make a, enough simplifications, then um, you end up with something that you can work with. Uh, okay, uh, so um, that ended up going a, a little bit faster than I expected, uh, but I am content to call it there. Uh, so uh, I will do my best to get a homework out for, uh, for you all tonight. Uh, and if I don't, um, then uh, I will uh, give you a little extra time and, and I'll post it tomorrow. But um, check for the homework. I, I do intend to post it before midnight tonight. Uh, okay. Uh, have a good evening. Uh, good luck on the homework. Talk to you on Thursday.